have you here. I think you're going to enjoy the evening, Rogers and Hammerstein, all these wonderful tunes that um, you may have forgotten. How, the sort of breadth of the songs that they um, composed over the years. Um, I want to start by thanking um, Chuck and Robbie Bro Bro for helping us uh, sponsor the season and getting a live orchestra out there for us. that we have this year. We actually have four new faculty members, and uh, I think two of them are not here, but uh, would you two guys come on up? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I came very quiet suddenly. So this is uh, Ben Reichel, and uh, Ben uh, comes to us. Um, you got your MFA from the University of Delaware. Right. And what else should we know about you? <laughs> uh, from Wisconsin originally, moved around a lot. Theater family, they're still in the business. And uh, went to Minnesota, then went to Delaware, and then lived everywhere else. Uh, and then started teaching, taught in Georgia, and then taught in Michigan for five years at uh, Western Michigan in Kalamazoo. And that's where we come from. And he's the assistant professor of acting and directing, and he's just really terrific. We're really glad to have him join our faculty. <laughs> well, here we have Dr. Scott Andrews, and um, you got your doctorate degree from Penn State. Yep. So tell us about yourself. As soon as he opens his mouth, you're going to have a kinship with certain folks in this room. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Um, <laughs> Kick off his in about 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I before um, I spent 10 years at Penn State earning my doctorate and you know relishing 10 years of earning a doctorate. Um, they finally said you, you you need to try something else. <laughs> um, before that though, I spent 30 years in the South. So this is where you pick up a. a Little accent, that's where it came from. Um, I earned my doctorate in speech communication, and so I come uh, bringing a background in a very, a very traditional program at Penn State. The, the Big Ten is very uh, into oral uh, performance, so uh, that makes it a good fit for this department, of course, being, being performative. And I'm really excited to be here at a at a, at a time of growth. I think we're really on to something. I agree. So he's an assistant professor of speech, and we're really delighted to have him here. And some of you, you know, I don't know if everybody really knows of all of our faculty, but I just want to point out Holly Bugglewitz back here. She's on our speech faculty. Uh, Janine Howe, who's been here just a, a year or two at this point. <laughs> Our faculty directing faculty, Nicole Breiter, of course, uh, is on our speech faculty, new to us as of last year. Um, Jeremy Franklin, you know him, he's been here a long time, and he'll be giving the lecture tonight. And uh, do we have any other faculty here? Oh, Jill Ben Russell, who is our uh, costume designer, and uh, really terrific in what she does. So that's some of the faculty. We'll have a bunch of other faculty here uh, during over the course of the season. Um, I also want to, uh, I'm really excited, I'm directing the next show, which is Our Town, um, which is, I've been reading a lot about it, it's such, such a fascinating um, uh, development of that script back in 1937-38, um, and uh, there was great debate about who the stage manager might be for that original Broadway production. Um, it actually almost uh, tore the director and the playwright, Thornton Wilder, apart in terms of trying to decide who would be that person. Uh, but we know who our person is going to be, and it's Diane Anglum who's going to be the stage manager. <laughs> Um, and finally, I do want to introduce our Bravo Scholars this year. Uh, we have four of the five of them here. We have Cassidy Phillips, and she's from Canyon City. 
We have Heather Porterfield from my hometown, Glenwood Springs. We have Murphy Baker, and she's from Houston. She survived, I think your family survived the yes. first and everything. Yeah, good. Um, and Tilly Leader back here is from Durango. So they're going to be great additions to the program. contribution that we just turn over and recruit these really wonderful students to our program. So we're still so grateful to all of you for supporting us and uh, helping us make this a great program. Jeremy, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Well, I have a couple things to say before I get started with the talk. I suspect that I'm looking for it. First of all, uh, uh, we uh, need to take a moment and thank our sponsors for the Bravo Behind the Scenes series. Um, they have been with us since the very beginning, uh, Bob and Louise Salmon. So, you please thank them for us. <laughs> and our wine sponsor for this uh, season is Danielle Dyer, who I think you've met a couple times. She uh, was our sponsor for the Cabaret. Uh, uh, excuse me, the Bravo Cabaret series last year, and now uh, she and her business, Barks Plains Day, are uh, sponsoring uh, the wine for this uh, particular season. Um, she is sorry to not be here. They are actually moving locations, um, and they still have 40 dogs there, so <laughs> they're moving locations. I said, it's okay, you don't have to be here. It, it will work out just fine. Um, so uh, I want to talk about that just a moment, but uh, I also want to remind you that we have a new um, Cabaret series called the Bravo Cabaret series. Uh, it was a great success last year. I don't know if any of you got to see it. It was so much fun. Uh, thank you, thank you. This year, uh, we're very happy to announce uh, that we have a new uh, sponsor and partner in that uh, series, and it is uh, Liz Sinclair, just here in the back. Liz <laughs> is the owner of Charlie Wellington's down on First and Main, and uh, she's the uh, co-sponsor for that series, and she's actually going to be the venue for the second concert. Uh, we'll have a Cinco de Mayo um, patio uh, concert, um, and it's going to be uh, Guilty Pop Pleasures. And I'm working on this subtitle, I'm going to try it on you. I'm, I'm, I'm subtitling it as Karaoke If All Your Friends Were Talented. Because it'll be, basically be all of us singing the pop songs that we should be proud of loving, but we do, and we're going to sing them. Uh, the first uh, cabaret, though, this season is uh, coming up here in the middle of October. It is, uh, we're beginning a four-year um, uh, cycle of cabarets that are going to focus on the American Songbook, the eight major players of the American Songbook. Um, and we're going to begin with Cole Porter and Irving Berlin. And uh, the cabaret is called Polar Opposites. Uh, because they are two of the most opposite human beings writing at the same time period in the same genre as you might find, uh, certainly in that time period. And their music is quite different from one another as well. So that'll be a lecture cabaret. We really uh, uh, invite you to come check that out. It's a lot of fun. I, I hope that those of you who, are, who were here with us last year remember us talking about the Western Colorado High School Performing Arts Festival, or what we lovingly and some of us hatingly call <laughs> Witch Path. <laughs> um, the, it's the longest name in festival history, I think, and, uh, you know, so anyway. Well, last year, you'll remember, we had started, um, we had done a soft open of this, which was going to be a festival for high school students who are interested in speech, uh, theater, uh, music theater, dance, and basically everything that we do, and tech, basically everything we do um, uh, in this building. We had four people uh, a, a year and a half ago in our soft open, four dancers, and we were like, yes, we've got four people. Last fall, we had 47 high schoolers and two high schools. Yesterday, we had 120 high schoolers from six different high schools as far away as Gunnison and Duray. And it was so much fun. Uh, and you can imagine, the. The audience was infused with 120 high schoolers last night. It was a great energy, and they just loved it so much. And I asked Jill um, to bring in um, some of these wonderful works that they did, and I'm going to encourage you to go check them out as we uh, come, as we uh, exit uh, today to go to the show. Um, she did a new. Why don't you talk really quickly about this? Well, we wanted to scoop in some of our aspiring uh, designers, and so we just told them there was going to be a mystery box challenge. So they had a box full of unconventional ingredients, like a school newspaper, uh, and some tape. 
a little pile of tools, and they had to design a full look uh, and an accessory in half an hour that under the theme of post-apocalyptic prom queen. <laughs> very creative, adventurous young designers, and it was really delightful to hear them talk about what they do and what their ideas are. And so they left their designs here. So we encourage you to pat as you pass it on your way out to check them out. They're really quite cool. Um, thanks, Joe. It was very cool. And thanks to all of our faculty who helped uh, make that such a wonderful day. It was exhausting, but uh, really a lot of fun. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before I get into the talk is um, uh, just uh, some exciting things that are happening uh, with our group Mesa Out Loud. I, I know uh, that many of you have heard them sing recently. We've been at the Art Center and a couple different things downtown. And uh, Mesa, for those of you who don't know, Mesa Out Loud is our six-member traveling contemporary commercial music group. Uh, and they uh, sing anything from musical theater to old jazz standards to hip hop and rock, uh, uh, not rock. <laughs> if you take rock and rap and you mash them together, they come up not as rock. That's not what they do. Anyway, uh, <laughs> country and rock. Um, and uh, it's been such a successful group over the last four and a half years that we've been working at. And one of the great successes of uh, the group has just recently come to light. And that is that at the moment, in the last four and a half years, we've graduated 12 people from that group. Okay? Of those 12 people who have graduated from that group, five of them are currently working as professional singers at high-grade contracts. Four of them are currently on um, the largest uh, cruise lines. We've got people on Norwegian, uh, no, Norwegian's the only one we don't have. We have uh, Carnival Cruises, we have Viking Cruises, we have Disney Cruises. Uh, no, we do have Norwegian, not Colin America, that's it. Um, and Royal Caribbean. And these are high level singing gigs. And for people who really want to travel, it's a great gig to have because you make good money and then you save it all up because you're not spending it on rent or um, anything like that. And so we're really excited. And so a lot of people have asked me over the last couple of months, why on earth did you pick a review show to open the theater season? When we were discussing how we should uh, proceed, and you know, every time we look at a season, we're looking at what do our students need, what do our students need. Um, and it came to light that we need to be teaching them the kind of shows that they may go and get hired to work in. And so that's why we chose this review. And so that's a great segue into my uh, talk tonight, which I'm going to try and keep short. <laughs> Everybody knock on wood. Um, tonight's talk is called Concept or Review. I think that most of you feel confident in, in understanding what a review is, a review show, right? A review is a show predominantly made up of music, um, historically, sometimes they've been about one particular songwriter's music, sometimes they're about a particular era of music, but it has very little dialogue, it never has a plot, uh, and it's just great music crammed together, usually with some song and dance or, uh, uh, performances as well, but uh, usually some comedy, but overall it's all about uh, music. Okay. And um, it, ha it comes from a very natural uh, development to be a part of the music theater um, uh, genre because it, it comes from the same place. Uh, everything comes back to vaudeville, American vaudeville, this uh, variety show uh, uh, type of entertainment that took place at the end of the 19th century, or excuse me, 20th century, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. That's, it's going to be that kind of night. <laughs> Um, and so um, it has this roots of, of the vaudeville shows, which it would incorporate not just great singing, but singing of all kinds. It would be singing about love. It would sing, uh, be singing funny songs. You would get serious ballads, and then you'd have you know dogs jumping through a hoop, and uh, then you'd have uh, people come out in very scantily clad, and, and they would uh, set up tableaus because it wasn't nudity as long as they were standing still. Uh, and you know, it wasn't dirty as long as they were standing still uh, and forming these tableaus. Um, and so this variety show is where the review branches off. And at the same time that the review branches off, we have musical comedy that comes to, uh, uh, to light. And musical comedy, uh, we really look at being a part of uh, the, late, uh, the late 19 teens all the way up until the early 1940s. Uh, and it's, you know, the writers that you want to love, Irving Berlin, uh, Rogers and Hart, uh, Cole Porter's a part of that time period. And the musical comedy was really a way of saying, okay, vaudeville's out of style, people like to hear about uh, stories and people's lives, so we'll create this very 
funny script, and then we're just going to shoehorn as many songs in there as we can. They're going to have nothing to do with the show, but you're going to have some, some scene going on, and then people are going to break out into song and dance, and that's really what most people were coming for, so everybody was happy. And then you get Rogers and Hammerstein, okay? And I, got, I, I really thought about in this talk, I'm like, don't talk about concept and review. Instead, talk about Rodgers and Hammerstein. You've been waiting for all this time to talk about Rodgers and Hammerstein. And I started going back through my notes, and I'm like, you've talked a lot about Rodgers and Hammerstein over the years. So, so I thought, well, you know, I've talked about more about Richard Rodgers. Let's talk a minute about Oscar Hammerstein. Oscar Hammerstein II uh, is a very interesting man. He's one of these people who is descended from a, fam a long line of musical theater people. His grandfather was Oscar Hammerstein I. And Oscar Hammerstein I was predominantly known as an opera impresario. In fact, when, in 1906, he opens the Manhattan Grand Opera, okay? He opens it, this is his eighth opera company to own, by the way. He, um, he opens it because he has this love of opera and created these large, spectacle productions of, of well-known operas as well as new operas by people like Puccini um, and all these wonderful European operas that he's bringing over for the first time. And he opens this eighth opera uh, company in New York City for one reason and one reason only, to fight with the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> and he does a very good job of it. He brings in all the great singers of the day from Europe, Tetrazine. Anybody know the name Tetrazine? Yeah, yeah Tetrazine. Uh, uh, she, uh, you know, she's one of the wonderful opera singers he brings in, and he's really good at it. He spends so much money on the costumes and on the set that he goes bankrupt multiple times. And at this particular time, he goes bankrupt. The Met is standing there, waiting. <laughs> and they walk over and they say, okay, you're, you're in debt. We'll buy you out of your debt. <laughs> but you have to sign a 10-year non-compete clause and never produce opera for the next 10 years anywhere on American soil. And he gets 1.2 million for it, so he signs for it and says, okay. And suddenly we see the Hammerstein brand move from being all about opera and operetta to being about this new thing called musical comedy. Now, Oscar number one, he had two sons, both of which become directors um, and uh, Oscar's dad, William, actually later becomes a stage manager. Now, there's a legend about Oscar number two's dad, uh, William. There's, there's this legend that he's the man who created the pie-in-the-face gag. Now, whether or not that's actually true or not, that's an old Hammerstein legend. Whether or not it's actually true, I, I've not seen any documentation, but I think it's an interesting thing. But William desperately begs his son and forces him to go to law school. Okay, he goes to Columbia University. I'm going to study law because we do not want you to go into the family business. That is not the typical story here, right? It's usually going to law because we don't want you going into that business. We would never let a family in. Instead, the Hammersteins are like, we've all been in it. Please don't do it. Don't do it. And he does. He goes to Columbia and he meets up with all these wonderful people, including a young Richard Rogers. They don't write together for another 20 years, however. So all of the Hammerstein family are uh, musical people, right? And when we look at Hammerstein's writing, Hammerstein's the first person in musical comedy to say, you know what? We could make these songs work with the stories. And he starts working with this wonderful composer who we'll be celebrating in a, in a year um, for our cabaret series named Jerome Kern. And they decide to take Edna Ferber's book, Showboat, and translate it to the stage. Well, if you've ever read Show, anybody ever read Show? Oh, you're missing out. Really a beautiful novel, I have to tell you. But it's, it's pretty dark at times. Uh, there's an issue of interracial marriage that does not end well. Uh, and uh, the whole family ultimately breaks apart, but it covers 40 years of this family living and operating in, in entertainment on uh, the showboat going up and down the city. And she writes this beautifully operatic libretto for Showboat, right? And if you listen to it, if you've ever seen Showboat, chances are you've actually seen Showboat in an opera company. Opera companies like to perform Showboat because the music tends to be really appropriate for operatic singers, and the scope of the show tends to be rather operatic. But early on, Hammerstein believed that everything should come back to the story. Everything. And so when he gets together with Richard Rogers, 
Richard Rogers had been working with Lorenz Hart for almost 20 years at this point. They had over 400 songs in print, things like My Funny Valentine. Uh, they, they had written all these wonderful things that had become jazz standards. And um, it had always been that Rogers wrote the music first, and Lorenz usually had to be locked in a room and forced to write the lyrics, partially because he was an alcoholic and, and, and typically had to be wrestled into a room. There were several uh, talks about uh, him being locked up just to finish the lyrics so they could get paid. Because of his alcoholism, uh, Roger and Hart eventually become incapable, incapable of working together. And so um, Rogers goes to Hammerstein and says, I've been approached by the guild, the theater guild, to write um, a new musical version of Green Grow the Lilacs. I can't trust Larry to write it, so I'm wondering if you'll write it with me. Hammerstein says, yes, but you have to go back and give Larry a chance. Come back to me in six months if you won't do it. Rogers went back to Hart. Hart said, go back to Hammerstein, and the rest is history. 1942, they opened this uh, show that started with this direction from the two having uh, sat out at the Hammerstein farm to discuss how to write the show. Hammerstein said, I will write this musical under one condition. The lyrics and the script come first, and the music for it comes second. And Rogers said, okay. Now let me tell you why that's amazing. This is an artist who, in, in his early 40s, has written one way for over two decades, and immediately changes on a dime to write in a completely different method than he's ever done before. That's pretty amazing in itself. What's amazing is how popular everything that they create becomes after that. Now, I could sit here and talk more and more and more about uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, but the truth is, is this is not a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. <laughs> You've all been tricked. Ha ha ha, joke's on you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there are 37 of Rodgers and Hammerstein's songs in this musical tonight, but it's not their musical because it doesn't follow the rules that Rodgers and Hammerstein set down in law for 20 some odd years. They wrote 11 shows over the period of 1942 to 1964 when Oscar Hammerstein died. He died while they were in production for uh, Sound of Music. Edelweiss was the last song he wrote before they wheeled him out to go uh, out of the theater. They actually had to wheel him in on a gurney um, to sit through some of the uh, tech rehearsals of uh, Sound of Music. Nato Vice was the last time I wrote. But it's not the musical, so I'm done talking about that. The, <laughs> Hammerstein, though, before he dies, his son, who all, all, all of his, both of his sons, uh, go into uh, directing and producing. And one of his sons, James, while he's away at college, becomes great friends with this man named Stephen Sondheim. And Stephen Sondheim shows up at the Hammerstein farm and immediately leeches onto Oscar Hammerstein as a father figure and a mentor. There's this wonderful story of Stephen Sondheim sitting through the opening night of Carousel and ruining Dorothy Hammerstein's fur because he sobbed so hard into her sleep. Um, Sondheim, a few years later, comes back to Hammerstein and says, I, I have written this musical, and I want you to look at it. And Hammerstein says, I will look at it but I will only look at it if you uh, promise to sit here and listen to everything I say about my notes about it. Like you have to actually listen to what I have to say about it. Sometimes like, absolutely, because he was so sure it was great and it was gonna be a next one we hit. So Hammerstein calls him out a couple days later and they spend the entire day with Hammerstein starting the day off with, it's not good. <laughs> but if you'll sit here, I'll tell you why. And step by step, he takes him through the entire script and the entire score and in one day, Sondheim says, my entire musical theater education began. And he, for the next five or six years, he, uh, uh, he works with Hammerstein. Hammerstein gives him an, uh, uh, an assignment to write three different types of book musicals, uh, what we would call these golden age musical types, that are all based on coming back to the, the uh, plot. That's what Hammerstein and Rogers have been all about. The swinging, the dancing, the comedy can't be like vaudeville, can't be like musical comedy. We can have it there, but it has to always come back to what the plot of the story is. So when Sondheim studies with Hammerstein, that's what he learns. However, as artists and young people will do, they grow up and they've heard what their mentors said, and they say, I'm going to do something different, and it's going to be better. Yes? So he goes off, and he tries to do that, and it doesn't work. 
And so he gets this opportunity to work with Leonard Bernstein, Arthur Lawrence, uh, West Side Story, right? And he goes to Hammerstein and says, I don't know if I should do this, man. They only want me to write lyrics. I want to write lyrics and music. I don't know why I'm doing this. And Hammerstein's like, look, it's Bernstein, and it's Arthur Lawrence, and they want to work with you. You will learn. Go. And so he does. And he does learn. Until 1968, when he's decided he's completely done with the book musical. He joins up with a man named Hal Prince, who later would be famous for Phantom of the Opera. Right, in the many, many, many sometime productions. And uh, 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 George Firth, and they decide to create George Firth's um, uh, one act plays into a new musical called Company. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Company really kind of broke the mold because Company did not start at the beginning of a story and, and go through the middle of the story and then go to the end of the story. In fact, there wasn't really a story the entire thing started in this singular ca uh, character's uh, apartment, Bobby, who doesn't even have a last name, and um, all his friends had shown up for his 30th birthday. And when you get to the end of the play, you're back at the very same moment that the play started in, with him walking in on his 30th birthday. And so we have this circular plot line that all it actually does is he goes from neighbor to neighbor and couple to couple, studying what it is to be wed and in love and not or not in love in the 1970s. And so critics came out and said, well, this is new and it's interesting and it's awesome, but it's not the old book musical. And they coded it the concept musical. And the, the definition of a concept musical became that it's a musical that is driven by thematic content more than a plot. It doesn't say that it won't have a plot, but that plot is not going to be the central element to what is holding together the show. And, and there's this wonderful quote by Oscar Hammerstein II. He gave it shortly before he died. It says, there are few things in life of which I am certain, but I am sure of this one thing. The song is the servant of the play. And then, this is what Sondheim says about company, after, of course, six years after his mentor has passed away. All the songs in company are inserted like nuts in a fruitcake. They're inserted into scenes, or they occupy the whole scene, but none of them just arises out of dialogue the way I've been trained to do by Oscar Hammerstein. And from this point on, we see the concept musical become a regular occurrence. Uh, one of the most popular concept musicals was opened in 1975, uh, a, a Chorus Line by Marvin Hamlish, uh, and uh, uh, it just went blank. Bob Avery. The, uh, and Michael Bennett, there it is, Michael Bennett. And if, if you know Chorus Line, Chorus Line doesn't have a plot line either. It has a general overview of these people walk in and they start the audition and they stand on the line and they get interviewed and at the end they have, they have a job or they don't have a job, right? And so that's its plot and it's very, very loosely placed. But instead, what it does is it studies these people who, from, from childhood all the way to um, being maybe a little past their prime as dancers, on what it is that made them want to become dancers, and what it was to grow up and, and to age in this art form where you're trying to be unique, but in the end, we all end up being a part of the chorus line. And so it was really fueled more by the thematic content than this loose plot. Sondheim goes on to do it many, many more times in, in shows like Assassins in, in the early 90s. Uh, he writes Assassins, and each of the characters in Assassins is a different person who has either successfully or attempted to uh, assassinate one of the presidents. And they exist in this weird carnival world, and over time we hear from each one of these characters about why they chose to do this. It doesn't have a plot line that begins from A to Z. It goes to Z. Instead, it challenges us to, uh, to look deeper into this thematic content of why do people choose to do this type of violence? Why would someone choose to uh, go to this extreme? Uh, same with Sunday in the Park with George, where it, 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 uh, underneath everything, it goes through, through George Seurat, the, the painter George Seurat. But that's only in the first act. The second act, it has this completely different storyline about this uh, fake grandson of his um, uh, who's uh, trying to um, become an artist in the 70s. And ultimately, the plot line doesn't really matter in that show as much as the thematic question of what is it to create art? 
What does it take out of us to create art? And most people will tell you that all of this type of concept musical began with company. I would argue with that. Company is the first time that we said, this is when, this is this. It was the first time we labeled it. But if you look to three years before company, you get to a musical called Hair. How many of you have ever seen either the movie or seen it live or been in it or sang the songs or, yeah, yeah. It's okay, you don't have to admit anything. But, <laughs> it's all right. But, Hair is a perfect example, three years earlier, of a concept musical. Some people would argue that it's a song cycle. Yes, there's this idea of a plot in there, but it's certainly not plainly uh, specified as it goes through. And many times it just goes on these little tangents, right? And it's really about this idea of the counterculture and uh, the issues with war during the, the, the 60s. Um, and it, it's more about the thematic content of these people living in this counterculture um, uh, life. We go even further back to Cabaret, which we think of as, oh, Cabaret has a, has a plot line, Jeremy. We, we talk about Cliff and, and Sally Bowles, and we see what happens when they meet, and we see what happens when they depart. That's the plot line, yes. That's one half of the play. But on the other half of the play is this mysterious Cabaret place where an MC rules everything and interjects commentary into the storyline. And in many ways, all of that comes back to being more about the theme of the play rather than what's going on with the plot of the characters. We go on, Fiddler on the Roof is certainly one of those. But I want to take you back even further, to 1933, to what most people will tell you was the, one of the greatest musical reviews written um, before 1915. It was written by a man named Irving Berlin, who we're going to celebrate in the first uh, cabaret this season. And the play's or the, the review was called As Thousands Cheer. Anybody ever heard of As Thousands Cheer? There's actually a movie version of it out there. Um, As Thousands Cheer was a musical review. It was going to be comedy scenes by Moss Hart, um, and uh, he wrote a loose um, a dialogue to connect everything together. But it was all going to be songs by Irving Berlin, which is really where Irving Berlin shone the most. Uh, he, he didn't do his best work when he was writing in the narrative storyline. Right? His songs were better to be put into other things, but he really was best just sitting down and writing a great song. And they decide that what's going to hold this musical review together, as thousands cheer, is this concept of every song having to do with a headline from that time period, or from that year. And so you have um, these uh, headlines about the Roosevelts with a, a uh, comedy scene about the Roosevelts in the White House. And then you have um, uh, the second act begins, uh, Ethel Waters. Anybody remember singer Ethel Waters? Oh, oh, my, oh my goodness, one of my favorite voices of all time. And uh, she was uh, the star of that show. And she began the second act, she ended the first act with this beautiful number called uh, Having a Heat Wave. And uh, all about uh, being in the George Islands, being a sexy king can dancer. And uh, then she comes back out the, at the beginning of the first act, and there's nothing on stage. And they fly in this headline, uh, Black Man Lynched in Alabama. And upstage, uh, in, uh, behind the, uh, the, uh, the site, you can see the shadow of a body hanging from a tree. There's nothing on stage, and Ethel Waters walks out uh, in a bandana uh, and, and uh, the, uh, this old South uh, garb, this lady <laughs> garb, if you will. Uh, and she walks out and she sings this ever famous song, Supper time, I must set the table because it's supper time. Somehow I'm not able because that man of mine ain't come home no more. And you probably heard that song sung by Barbra Streisand. It does not carry the same weight as Barbra Streisand. Uh, <laughs> it's beautiful, but it doesn't carry the same weight. And so this thematic element of, handle, of, of dealing with ch not just the, the humorous of the time period, but also dealing with the social issues of the time period. And everything is held by, together, not just by presence of the Museum of in Berlin, but that it all follows this, this theme of the headlines of the day. And before every single scene, you'd see a headline flying in that was from the newspapers that was relevant to the scene and to the song the dance that was going to follow. The concept review that has been around for a long time, concept musical. Not all reviews are concept musicals, but some of them are. And this show tonight is a concept musical. It's a show about the cycle of love. It's a show about 
what it is to have that youthful um, first experience with romance, and what it is to, to have those playful 20s, and, and then to, to get into the 30s and 40s and fall in love, and, and get married, and then to have children, and then to kind of fall out of love, and then to remember what it was like to be a child and dream of love to come. And that's the idea that we started with when we worked on this show. Someone asks all the time, and I've successfully not been short. <laughs> that's the last thing I'll say. Someone asks all the time to directors, every one of these directors has been asked at some point, what's your process? And most of us will tell you that the show dictates the process. Yes, I have these things I do to get myself into the body of the show, but the show tells me what the process is. And when I started this show back in April with Jill and Chris and Mike and Doug, of course, who's leading the bands and, and the singers tonight, we thought it was one thing. I thought I was going to give you just a regular old, lovely, glitzy cruise ship show. And what we came to find was it's this concept and so the process has been different from anything I've ever done. We studied Device Theater and uh, Frantic Assembly, this wonderful company in the UK and in Australia. And we spent two weeks improvising through these songs. <coughs> Not to create some characters that don't exist, but to find what the songs mean to us right now. And what we found are these wonderful performers who have delved into themselves and pulled out something beautiful and honest. And that's what I hope you see tonight in this lovely concept review. Thank you so much. And I'm